Today is October the 3rd in 2023, and my guest is Andrew Cote. Andrew is a nuclear fusion engineer at Stellarator Systems and a scout at A16Z. He has a fantastic sub-stack called Lysis and a foundational piece called the Fusion Energy Landscape there that I can highly recommend that I learned a lot from. Today, we're going to talk about nuclear fusion, the promise of the technology and the pathways for adoption. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Andrew, is there anything uh, that you'd like mention about yourself in an intro that I haven't mentioned yet? Oh, um, no, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah. I also write things on Twitter sometimes too. So if you're active on that, that's probably where I put more stuff than anything, but occasionally write longer things on Substack too. So no, that's great. Thanks. Sure. That's how I found out about your work. You really good Twitter. So let's start with the fundamentals of the technology. Can you briefly explain what is nuclear fusion and how does it differ from fission? Sure, totally. Yeah. So nuclear fusion is actually the most common uh, energy producing process in the universe by far, right? So fusion is what occurs inside stars. You know, the reason stars are hot and the reason they emit light is because of nuclear fusion. And what happens inside stars is that there's a whole bunch of mass that is confining and compressing and crushing uh, the stuff stars are made of, which is mostly hydrogen. Um, so as hydrogen gets to super high temperatures and super high densities, those atoms of hydrogen, which will normally repel each other because of their electrically charged nuclei, because the nucleus is positively charged, protons, um, You'll overcome that electrical repulsion because of this density and temperature, and they'll end up sticking together via something called the strong nuclear force, which is like a short range, very attractive force. Um, and when they, when they stick together, they basically fall down hill in terms of energy and release a bunch of energy as heat. So when you combine things in fusion, they will release energy. Um, that's what powers stars. Interestingly enough, when you have very large unstable nuclei, like radioactive elements like plutonium, what's going on there is that the positive charges in the nucleus are now so far away from each other that they can no longer feel each other's strong attractive force and they just feel each other's repelling electric force. And so when you have a large nucleus and that splits apart, you can release energy. So that's nuclear fission, like uranium and plutonium, which are very large, heavy atoms. When you have very light atoms, and you combine together, you can also release energy. And it seems weird, it works both ways, right? Well, actually what happens is there's a most stable, nu nuclearly stable element, which is iron. So anything lighter than iron, when you fuse it together, releases energy. Anything heavier than iron, if it splits, it can also release energy. Um, yeah, so, so all of the energy we receive on the planet in the form of solar radiation comes from nuclear fusion, right? All of the energy we access as living creatures, also as hydrochemicals, comes from stored solar energy via carbon bonds that are built up by living systems over time. Um, the geothermal energy inside the planet comes from largely fission, actually. So that's one place where fusion energy is not the ultimate source. Those are highly, those are radioactive elements that are slowly releasing heat over time. About 30% of geothermal energy is also from the original energy of gravitational collapse of the planet, which is kind of an interesting side note. Um, yeah, yeah. So fusion energy is sort of like this thing that's kind of miraculous in the universe and fusion energy on the planet earth is this attempt to build devices that can fuse hydrogen into helium or fuse other kinds of light elements to release energy. And that would be amazing because these elements are super abundant, right? Like hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and isotopes of hydrogen are also very abundant. Um, Whereas plutonium and uranium are very hard to get. You have to mine them out of the earth. They're hard to get. You can also use them to develop nuclear bombs and so forth. And fission reactors have this risk of meltdown, which is, which I think has, has played a large role in people's imagination of nuclear power. But I think our safety record and actual impacts is, is quite good. Um, but fusion energy, it's kind of like a, another kind of nuclear energy where it has very high power density, a uh, very abundant uh, supply of fuel, and it releases no carbon into the atmosphere, which we like. So it's stable, it's reliable, it's base load grid power with no CO2 impact, apart from just the cost of construction materials. Um, yeah, that's kind of fusion energy in a nutshell. 
Yeah, you, can, you already started, but can you expand a bit on what makes nuclear fusion, uh, like literally the energy from the stars, right? What makes it such a insuperable opportunity or chance to save our civilization? What makes it so great? Oh, right. Could, right. Me, me. What's, why, why is this kind of the source that you think can make energy super abundant and too cheap to meter? Mm, right. Yeah, it's interesting. So this phrase, too cheap to meter, actually originally came from this era of nuclear energy optimism in the 1950s, where people thought that we could build nuclear power plants and that they would be very stable and reliable. And the fuel is very, um, you know, uh, easy to secure in the sense that coal and oil, you have to burn such massive quantities. You have to constantly be extracting the stud of the earth. And there's geopolitical limitations on where you can get hydrocarbons from. And those inconsistencies in the supply of hydrocarbons because of their low relative energy density and so the high requirement for mining and refining and, and production, you know, nuclear energy is generally different because you could fuel a reactor with like, you know, just a relatively small amount of material for decades, right? So you, you, can, you can get all the fuel ahead of time, very, like lock in that fuel ahead of time. Um, fusion is similar in the sense that uh, you're able to get the fuel uh, relative. Well, okay, let's actually back up a second. Why is fusion so great? To power civilization into the distant future, you need an energy supply that is incredibly cheap, that is abundant, that is reliable, and that um, a lot of people now are thinking more and more about intermittency, meaning you know, the sun isn't always shining, the wind isn't always blowing. You need reliable, stable base load power for the winter for places where you can't use solar, right? That kind of stuff. Renewables are really great where, where you can place them, but you can't always make them work everywhere. So um, uh, nuclear fusion is a way of producing stable base load power where the fuel, you can extract a lot of it from very common materials. So one example is seawater, right? So one kind of fusion fuel is called deuterium. Deuterium is a, a naturally occurring isotope of hydrogen. I think it's something like one in every 3,000 or it might be 30,000, kind of print number. Um, but it's a naturally occurring isotope of hydrogen that you can extract from seawater, right? And if you were to take the deuterium from one gallon of seawater, I did the math on this, it's kind of cool. If you were to take the gal uh, deuterium from one gallon of seawater and burn that in a fusion reaction, it would release the energy equivalent of 800 gallons of gasoline, right? And that's because nuclear reactions release millions of times more energy per atom or per molecule than chemical energy. And the, the way to understand that really is that nuclear forces are incredibly strong compared to chemical forces. Chemical forces, chemical, what I mean by that really, chemical forces, you know, chemical bonds are basically electron orbitals that lock together in certain ways and they snap and reform. And when we get energy from hydrocarbons, what we're doing is we're combining carbon with oxygen, right? And those things snap together with so much violence, like two little, little strong magnets or something, um, that they will release heat and light as well. So nuclear forces are, are way, way stronger, right? Um, inside the nucleus, the binding energies are millions of times higher. The strong nuclear force is so much stronger than electromagnetism. That's why they named it the strong force, I guess. Uh, and so the energy released when you combine atoms is, is millions of times more than the energy released when you combine molecules. Um, yeah, so it's like an intuition. So, you know, nu uh, nuclear fusion, because you can get the fuel uh, from a lot of common places. One other kind of fusion fuel is boron, which makes up like 11% of the Earth's crust. Now, right now, fusion companies are approaching a, a mix of strategies in terms of reactor designs and the kinds of fuels they want to burn. Some of those fuels are actually hard to get. So tritium, another isotope of hydrogen, is in much shorter supply. And you actually have to make tritium by bombarding lithium-6 with neutrons because it'll form, you know, it kind of radioactively decays into tritium and then you can use that. Deuterium and tritium are the most common fuel mixture for fusion reactor designs because they burn at the lowest temperature. So it's easier to get deuterium tritium to burn, right? Tritium is harder to get, deuterium is easy to get. Another fuel mixture pursued by some companies is using helium-3. Helium-3 can, can combine with a proton and form a, a charged alpha particle or basically helium nucleus. Um, and, you know, so Helion is a company that many people have heard of because of its associations with kind of Y Combinator or something like that. Um, 
they want to burn helium-3. That's tough to get. There's only 25 kilograms on the planet Earth. So another issue is how do you get helium-3? Well, I think you can actually also produce it via bombardment. Tri tritium decays into helium-3, if I recall correctly. So, so there's different sort of fuel mixtures. There's different kind of reactor designs. But the whole net net is that if you can make one of these devices work, and we're making steady progress towards making this work, then you can get stable, reliable, base load power for incredibly cheap. And if you think long term about any kind of energy supply, you can bring a lot of economies to scale on the production of the reactor and the plant facility, right? You can get better and better at doing that and, and make them cheaper and cheaper, more efficient over time. But your sort of variable cost is always the cost of the fuel, right? So long as that fuel is expensive, that energy supply will be expensive. And the nice thing about fusion is that the fuel can be incredibly cheap, like, like almost just free, right? Like just get it as seawater. Um, yeah, I did a calculation on Twitter and it was a very napkin level math. This is not as super precise, but our energy demands have grown consistently at about two, two and a half percent for decades, right? Even for longer, really. So if you were to project out our energy demand into the future at 2% compounding annually, how long until different supplies of fuel run out, right? And I think the math was something like for fission, it's you get 500 years. Solar power in about 700 years, uh, I think you just basically, you have to tile the entire planet's surface with solar panels to, to collect that much energy. But if you just took the deuterium from ocean water, right? You would have enough fuel for a thousand years, a thousand years of 2% compounding growth, right? And so that's, that's the energy, total energy consumption annually doubling every 35 years, right? So that's, that's a lot doubling for every 35 years for a thousand years. That's a lot of doublings. Okay. So the abundance and the energy density of fusion fuel, it's cheap availability in the world is, is a really compelling argument that makes fusion energy like a very optimistic long-term solution to our energy needs. Great. And, and you already hinted at a few of those. But what are, as of now, kind of the most, like, is it only an engineering challenge or is there also science challenges that remain? And yeah. what are those engineering and science challenges? It's a great question. So we're fortunate. Um, you know, we like to say in science, you stand on the shoulders of giants. And the giants of the fusion industry really are all of these Department of Energy national labs and, and university research teams all around the world that have worked for decades to de-risk the science behind fusion, right? To really understand plasma instabilities, our ability to model. So one thing I should say is that what is happening inside a fusion reactor, right? It's this super hot gas we call plasma. And a plasma, it's like a normal gas, except the electrons and, and the ions, the nuclei are, are separated. So they're just, they're free to move around. So in that plasma, you have electrical currents that generate magnetic fields as well as electrical charges, which accelerate, which, which push other charges in addition to kind of fluid dynamics, turbulence issues and instabilities. And so it's a very complicated, uh, chaotic kind of self interacting system. Um, yeah, it's, the whole field is called magnetohydrodynamics. So the science of magnetohydrodynamics has been really one of the big kind of triumphs of this like fusion energy research program we've had for decades in the United States um, and, and worldwide. There's other countries that have worked on this for a long time. Actually, the USSR, Soviet Union, really uh, did a lot of foundational work in, in developing the tokamak, which was like the number one sort of, you know, researched object for fusion energy for a long time. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we've done a lot of de-risking of the science in an area of fusion you'd call magnetic confinement fusion, right? Um, a, a, and also related area of magneto inertial confinement. So there's kind of three flavors of fusion very broadly. There's actually four, but electrostatic confinement is not as popular. Um, magnetic confinement, which is like low density, high temperature, long, long confinement time. There's magneto inertial confinement, which is like kind of the middle realm. It's like kind of medium density, medium temperature, medium time. And then there's the inertial confinement. That's like the laser systems at NIF. We had the big announcement uh, a while ago. Um, we're compressing a solid fuel of deuterium with lasers. And, and there's a kind of, so that's, that's density energy distribution also kind of correlates with like engineering versus science risk, right? So when it comes to confining a super hot plasma, that's very not so dense, like a tokamak, we've built a lot of tokamaks actually as a society, as a species. And, and the science risk on those is, is pretty well de-risked, right? That's really an engineering problem. It's an engineering problem of building 
uh, magnets that can produce super high fields, of, produ of, of building shielding that can capture the energy of these high energy radioactive byproducts, neutrons that hit stuff and heat things up, um, as well as like extracting the energy from that, from that heat, you know, circulating these liquid lithium uh, barriers that try to capture neutrons to breed more tritium fuel and so forth. So this is really, it's the realm of like kind of what I'd call like old school hardcore engineering, right? You need tons of steel, you need kilowatts of cooling or, you know, or megawatts of, of heat extraction and so forth and mega amps of current. And it's just really in that world of old school hardcore engineering, which is a lot of fun. I think that's, that's really awesome. Um, the science risk on other fusion approaches is a bit different, I think. So laser inertial confinement as a research program has been funded publicly only for the purpose of weapons research, right? That's something people maybe don't always catch in the news is that NIF and uh, so National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab is a project. I was actually supposed to go work at LNL, L LNL in the past, and then I ended up taking a detour through biotech, but um, it's really amazing top of the line research science facility that was started in 1996, uh, just after the United States became signatory to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, right, which bans all further atmospheric nuclear tests, and all this kind of stuff. So Department of Energy is part Department of Energy. It's also the department of keeping our nuclear bomb stockpile, like tip top shape, whatever, I think it's right? It's kind of most of the funding goes into it. Right? Uh, I'm not sure about the funding breakdown, actually. Um, but the Department of Energy, I love because they fund so many foundational scientific breakthroughs across hundreds of different subdisciplines. And the national lab system is like the crown jewel of the scientific international community, in, in my opinion. Um, um, but part of their mandate is also to, you know, understand and maintain nuclear weapons, right? Um, so NIF, uh, that experiment with this indirect drive laser, what I mean there is that they have this like tube that's made of like gold and I think diamond and stuff, some esoteric materials, as well as inside a little peppercorn of frozen deuterium. They blast that with a huge amount of laser power to simulate what happens in a hydrogen bomb. Because in a hydrogen bomb, you have a first stage that is like a fission bomb that produces a whole bunch of energy. And then that ends up condensing and compressing a second stage, which is this kind of deuterium tritium mix that gives you actually most of the yield of the bomb. Um, it's very interesting. So. So I think our, our understanding of this implosion sort of shock front that's traveling at, you know, the speed of sound through a tiny little object that's being irradiated with tons of laser pressure and so forth. I think my understanding, well, so my understanding is that there's perhaps still science risk and, and some less known engineering challenges to get that into a system and setup that's good for energy capture. Um, I know there's companies working on that and I think that's awesome. I think really what we want as a species is to be exploring the possible configuration space of different fusion reactor designs and, and methods. Um, but I know that in terms of like how many teams have built tokamax and how many teams have built like sort of magnetic confinement, you know, stellarators as well, right? I, wor I work on stellarators, which is kind of like a, kind of like a better version of a tokamak really. We can get into that later, but, uh, um, yeah, I think our, our collective technical understanding of, of how to build those systems that are explicitly for energy production is much higher. We've recently, after a long period of effort and scientific diligence, successfully tested laser inertial confinement for weapons research. There is a translation step to occur that can take that weapons research, right? into energy production, I think. And, and I think there's lots of other considerations for the laser inertial confinement. So there's a distribution of science risk. On one side, it's really just like engineering. On the other side, there's, there's a bit more foundational work. Um, but there's reasons to, be, to, to think that that scientific effort is still worthwhile in laser inertial confinement, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's kind of a, it's kind of a distribution. There's a, whole, there's a whole fusion energy landscape out there, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Also uh, pointing at your great piece of fusion energy landscape. So, so there are a couple of areas where the challenges are mostly engineering and a couple of other areas where there's more science risk or approaches that are not yet popular, right? I think cold fusion also fits in that, right? So there's science risk with that, right? I think cold fusion is, is, is way further along the spectrum of science risk than any inertial confinement yeah, yeah. intermagnetic or, yeah, that's, uh, I, I haven't seen any promising 
developments in that area, but I can't claim to be well-versed with it either. I, I had a close friend who worked with um, Google and a couple other research universities investigating some kind of a cold fusion approach for a while, and it kind of went nowhere. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's a different kind of bullshit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious about that because I had Jay Storrs Hall on my podcast who wrote the book, Where's My Flying Car? And he just uses right. cold fusion as an example of where sort of the science funding uh, running out or just um, through because of political reasons, not getting the funding anymore, made us basically miss out on a couple of decades of like reducing mm. the scientific risk there, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, I'm very open to being convinced on the merits of that research program. Um, yeah, that's always a tough one, right? Because you have, unfortunately, we have very finite budgets and finite resource allocation. And, and so we have to think judiciously on what are the highest leverage ways to spend our, our limited fusion energy funding. It's actually something of a tragedy. We, uh, and when I say we, I mean, basically the United States. <laughs> I'm Canadian, but I mean, this is, I live in the US and a lot of the work happens in the US and I'm sure the audience is US. So, um, you know, most of the funding and fusion went to Tokamaks for a long time. Right. Um, there was kind of in, in the 50s, there was a sort of a proliferation of different ideas on how to build a fusion reactor. Right. There was a Z pinched machine. There was um, Stellarator was first developed in Princeton. It was actually one of the earlier kind of design concepts. Um, there was a few other, you know, field reverse configuration. There's a few other kind of like reactor designs that came out and they all suffered some problems, mainly because we didn't understand plasma that well. Right. So we had a lot of unknown science risk at the time. The Soviets came out and published their data on tokamaks, which kind of blew everything else out of the water, right? This fusion energy research was actually one of the first big East-West collaborations in the Cold War. Uh, you know, fusion did a lot to help thaw those relations, um, which is very interesting. Um, and so when those results came out, sort of the, the research programs internationally really just all shifted to tokamaks and tokamaks became the number one focus for a long time. Um, and so I think if you look historically, like 95% of funding research went to tokamaks for decades in the US. And, and then actually the research funding started to dry up. Uh, there was kind of this death valley in the fusion world, right? Where research programs were dwindling in funding, big national projects were getting canceled the last second, you know, um, which is a real tragedy. And uh, now we have kind of a renaissance that, that's come back up uh, really enabled by some key breakthroughs in material science, as well as, um, I think maybe a, a broader time horizon for foundational investments into deep tech ventures that we recognize could have dramatic impact on sort of civilizational challenges, which, which I'm, I'm really optimistic for actually in our thinking beyond sort of, you know, uh, investment return over say five years or something, but let's think really big in, in what are the biggest problems facing us. And, and so I think now it's a pretty exciting time where we've kind of done a lot of the scientific grunt work in the trenches in, in, in understanding foundational problems. There's been a few key advances in material science and, and also our ability to simulate, understand plasma that has set the stage for this technology as a field to come out of national labs and get commercialized and kind of like absolutely just rocketed with the injection of, of private capital because a private company just operates so differently than a national lab and their ability to execute quickly uh, and so forth and the like sort of ambition of the timelines and everything um so i think this is really a you know we've had like a kind of a fusion renaissance which is very exciting and i think that's that's a lot of our current public awareness of this is built on recognizing that this is there's now a fusion industry with so 40 some companies operating the space and uh you know 10 years ago um there was maybe three right um when i first worked at a fusion company general fusion i think at the time there was maybe four or five or six or something it's like hardly i think helion was around at the time but just getting started and a few other like tri alpha energy has been around for a long time general atomics is kind of a defense contractor with the fusion back end or something um so some companies been around for a while but now there's really you know, uh, a kind of a gold rush into the area uh, as people realize, oh, damn, well, people, you know, there's this, it's interesting. So many of these designs are from the 70s and 80s, right? People blowing the dust off these DARPA DOE advanced research program projects from national labs and thinking, damn, this was a really good idea. Like we should, you know, why'd they stop this? And they, and they do the, you know, the stack trace in the project. It's like, oh, they ran out of funding, congressional budget or whether it got slashed because, you know, some different political party got elected and you're like, damn, what? 
So, so now there's companies like rebuilding Z-Pinch devices and FRCs. Helion's using FRC, which is like a, a concept from that era and, and Zap Energy and so forth. And Stellarators. Stellarators, what I work on. So this is also in the world of science and engineering risk. Stellarators had a really big breakthrough. Um, so tokenmax were like the hot, the, hot ki- the hot new kid in town for a long time, right? In fusion energy world. Um, and and Stellama- Stellarators, as had initially been designed, showed worse confinement. And by confinement, I just mean, how good is this fusion device at building up the energy required to start fusing, right? It's kind of like, how easy is it to get this engine going? Um, so in 1986, Alan Boozer, who was another Princeton uh, plasma physicist, came out with this, you know, kind of new actual theoretical conceptualization or, or parameterization of stellarators, under, understanding, exploiting some hidden symmetries in the kind of how particles travel along this plasma, uh, you know, configuration, how they travel along this, like what, what you call magnetic flux surface, basically just a, a closed tube of magnetic field. Um, so it was that sort of conceptual or theoretical breakthrough that enabled people to start redesigning stellarators with much, much better confinement, with like really great performance. And that, that's, that's been really incredible. So, um, so now there's, you know, the kind of stellarator rebirth really, right? Cause it was first in the fifties and kind of died out and then now it's back. And so Wendelschein W7X in Germany, um, Greifswald, you know, run by the Max Planck Institute of Positive Physics is like the world's kind of one of the biggest stellarators right now. I think it is the biggest stellarator, but there's now a few company startups that are also pursuing stellarators, um, which is also very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that fascinating question. Like we had an episode or several episodes on decentralized science, um, mostly in biotech, but also J Stores Hall is pointing at the problem of like public funding, right? Because, you know, priorities change and often the budgets are allocated in a political way. But the good news seems to be when it comes to fusion, there is a couple of sort of pathways where the science is de risk and there's an engineering challenges that, that are remaining, which is great. Um, so what do you think, or what's your prediction, um, of who gets there first or not necessarily which company, but which kind of, um, engineering approach or which, um, approach to, to fusion or fuel? Mm, yeah, this is a question I get sometimes. And it's always really interesting because I think it reveals a couple of hidden assumptions that, that we should look at carefully. Fusion energy, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Right. <laughs> My friend actually the a company called Marathon Fusion, which is really cool. Um, yeah. So by that, I mean, uh, the first reactor to work in terms of achieving break even energy production is not necessarily the long term economically most performative device. Right. Um, there's no reason why it would be, uh, you know, so often like the first versions of stuff that kind of just barely work aren't the thing you actually end up going with in the long term. Right. Um, that being said, I mean, it's, it's very clear, right. That tokamaks are the most researched and well-developed, uh, kind of, uh, program of fusion energy science and the companies working on tokamaks right now, like just Commonwealth fusion is also, I think the, one of the furthest along in, in building a test demonstration prototype plant and, and so forth. And so they've been very open with their research progress the whole time. They're, they're like really well-respected fusion community, a lot of really top quality people work there. Um, so they're, they're, they're incredible as, as, as a operation for sure. Um, that said, you know, whether tokamaks sort of end up being the best design in the long term actually depends not on who gets there first, right? It depends on how stable they are to operate, how easy they are to operate and, uh, the kind of performance characteristics, right? So, so the kind of the, the quick tagline on tokamaks versus accelerators has always been, well, um, Tokamaks are easier to design and build because they're nice and symmetric, right? Like in the kind of rate, like kind of, uh, they have this cylindrical symmetry in a way or toroidal symmetry, but they're hard to operate. And what do I mean by they're hard to operate? I mean that they are susceptible to disruptions in the plasma where it will start to undergo some runaway turbulence and that can release the stored energy inside the device in a destructive way, not destructive in the sense like a vision power plant meltdown where the building's on fire, this kind of stuff, but more so like, you know, it's like, like a detonation of high energy inside the device that would, you know, break some magnets or they'd breach the shield wall or something. Um, so actually, I mean, that doesn't happen because people design tokamaks with the interior 
tiled with like tungsten armor and so forth to handle these disruptions. So, so you know, Tokamex are the kind of the clear crowd favorite for who's going to get there first in, in terms of like break even fusion energy production. Um, longer term, though, Stellarators are really way easier to operate. They're steady state and the plasma is much more stable. And, and there's interesting reasons why that is. Um, you know, Tokamak is pulsed in operation. You have to ramp up the field of your magnet coils over time. So you can ramp them up, you can ramp them down, but you can't just ramp them indefinitely forever, like building up current forever. So you have to basically turn it on and off, turn it on and off. Um, and you do that to circulate a very large amount of current that goes in the loop around the torus, like kind of around the racetrack of the donut shaped plasma, right? So that large amount of circulating current is what's liable to disrupt and kind of hit the wall of your thing. And so Eater has like, Eater is a big research collaboration in France, the world's largest tokamak. It's massive. It has around 60 megajoules of circulating stored energy. And when that disrupts, when that hits the wall, that's like 60 sticks of dynamite going off, right? So it's like a small bomb. This is like pretty powerful. Um, Stellarators don't have the same kind of circulating current. They don't have the same kind of plasma disruption issues. And actually you can, you can operate them at steady state, right? So you can have continuous, continuous operation, um, which is awesome, I think. So I'm, I'm quite bullish on that. Um, there's lots of other designs that are really interesting that also have varying degrees of scientific and engineering risk and trade-off. One, you know, so Stellarators and Tokamax are both lower density devices proposing to burn deuterium tritium. That kind of fusion fuel, right? DT fusion fuel, it releases its energy in a way that's kind of hard to capture, um, which is as heat, really. It releases high energy neutrons and those bounce around and deposit their energy as heat in surrounding material, right? So you need lots of shielding, and then you also need a heat exchanger, right? Some fusion devices, their approach doesn't release their energy as neutrons, which have to bounce around and get converted to heat. They actually release energy as fast moving charged particles. So those charged particles, you can extract energy from directly. You know, they can push on a magnetic field, which will drive current in a coil, and so you can get more efficient energy capture from that, right? Um, so, but, but then, you know, those devices, see, there's really just, it's a, it's a field of trade-offs, right? So burning that kind of fuel is harder. You have to get to higher temperatures, right? It's a less likely reaction. Okay. So you, there's, there's no one size fits all really. It's really interesting. The space of engineering trade-offs is quite large. It's quite vast. And so who wins the fusion game, um, is not really the same question as who gets there first. Um, and, and I think the long-term fusion game is going to be won by companies that can, that, that have like, you know, stable operation, high uptime, reliability, ease of maintenance and, and reactor maintenance and so forth, have abundant available fuels, all this kind of stuff. So it's, yeah, that wasn't a straight answer, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, I like your answer. I mean, that mirrors a lot of what I hear also in other frontier tech communities are also listen to this interesting episode with Richard Rhodes, the historian of the Manhattan Project. And, you know, when you're there at the frontier, things are far from clear, like which ones, wh what's going to work or to win out, right? Yeah. So one thing that really yeah, stuck yeah. with me in that interview about the Manhattan Project was that much of the really expensive testing was really for nothing, right? They were chasing down like dead ends and the wrong rabbit holes. And then it was like right. a really simple, like conceptual theoretical step that was missing that everyone overlooked mm -hmm. and someone mm -hmm. got to make that step that was, that made all the yeah. difference and really all the testing was really much. So you don't know when you're there, right? So which one's going to so win this, out? This, 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 the, the labyrinthine nature of exploring the secrets of science and understanding the universe that is filled with hundreds of dead ends and then occasional revelations is I think the best argument for this world of publicly funded scientific research, basic science research, because you actually don't know what's going to pay off in the long run, right? It, it's really hard to tell. So, so as soon as funding basic science research becomes sort of like, well, what, what's the company going to spin out of this thing? And what's this going to, you know, that metric will suddenly prune the tree of science in such a drastic way that it, you might not actually grow into this sort of golden age future, right? Just as an example on this, on, on the, in the context of fusion energy. So, you know, 1986 was a great year for fusion. I, I don't know if I'm collapsing all the years in my head. I might just be 84, 86, but so you had the accelerator reconceptualization. You had the meeting between Gorbachev and Reagan, Reagan in Reykjavik, Iceland. 
which established Eater as a project, right? That was explicitly, let's have, let's have more collaboration East and West. So it kind of spun up this Eater project that US later pulled out of whatever reason. Um, and the other one was the discovery of yttrium barium oxide high temperature superconductors, right? Which was incredible. So, you know, the theory of superconductivity up until that point basically said this phenomenon will only ever be observed at very low temperatures, right? On the order of like a couple Kelvin or, or negative 270 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um, and that was like, you know, BCS theory. So Barton, Cooper, and Sch Schreifer, Schleifer, I forget, uh, developed this theory for superconductivity. John Bardeen, crazy physicist, only guy to ever win two Nobel Prize prizes for the invention of, this, of, the, of the semiconductor and then also superconducting theory. So 1986 comes along. These researchers find a new material that can superconduct at like 77 Kelvin or 70 Kelvin or something, which is totally insane. That just broke all of our theoretical understanding of how this fundamental phenomena works. And, you know, over the next several decades, that scientific breakthrough got translated into a practical engineering product that you can buy today by the thousand kilometer called HTS tape, high temperature superconducting tape. And, and that material, that manufactured good is one of the sort of watershed things that is enabling the current renaissance of fusion companies because all these magnetic confusion magnetic confinement fusion relies on developing very strong magnetic fields right you build those strong fields with current that travels in an hts or sorry in, in a in an electromagnet and so carrying that current with no resistance is is awesome right you can get much higher fields that way but it's been very hard to take that you know scientific discovery translate it into an engineering product but the ability to do that that so if we had this translational worldview, we would only fund things that had already been discovered, right? You, you wouldn't be, you, you know, your, your grant administrator would look at this project to say, oh, we're like investigating superconductivity at these high temperatures that has never been seen before. There's no theoretical justification for it, or, or there's more contentious justification for it and so forth. You say, that's silly. I'm going to invest in something more translatable. But then that, that basic science breakthrough is what enabled now this massive wave of translation, right? So. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think I mean, really I'm not entirely convinced of that argument. Like I'll have Terence Keeley on the podcast soon. He speaks sort of like, makes the case against public funding of science. You have to kind of make the economic counterfactual, right? So how would it have been in a world where there was, right? So we always make the assumption, all right. So in that landscape, we don't have public, it wouldn't get funded. And he points at like the industrial revolution, right? Where you didn't have any public science. <laughs> Yet we made some of the biggest progress in history, right? In science and technology that led to, to, to a lot of progress, right? So, and the argument that well, so like the during that time effect, period, right? During that time period, scientists were just rich people that had leisure time. So Anthony von Leeuwenhoek and Faraday and all these guys, right? They just were, they were hobby scientists, right? There was no science profession. So the yeah. emergence of science as a profession depends on these research institutions that we call universities. Um, there's lots of things that I think can be improved in how science is conducted by a species. I think it would be, um, you know, to say that we should defund public science because crowdsourcing that to non-experts is going to get more effective outcomes. I would really be interested to understand those arguments more carefully. I, I think that would be an interesting conversation. Yeah, I'll go um, into this in more depth in that podcast, right? So it's definitely not right? an argument that is widely accepted, right? So yeah. to be I can um, taken with scrutiny with, with a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, from an cool. economics point of view, I get it, right? Because, you know, a similar argument in like education, right? So kids are also like a long-term investment, whatever. But anyway, we don't have to go too deep into that. I'm actually more curious at what I wanted to talk about is um, the regulatory pathway to adoption, right? And I'm asking, you know, the topic of this podcast is trend technologies. And like we messed it up once already with nuclear fission, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, how, what is the kind of pathway for regulatory adoption? Or is there something like a framework or regulatory framework for nuclear fusion? Uh, there is. It's being developed ongoing is being developed in an ongoing fashion but there's uh in the last year or two um there's new sort of guidelines have been released by the department of energy about you know what are what's the approval process what's like the siting requirements and the liability and this kind of stuff for building a a fusion pilot plant project right 
And so anything nuclear fission is administered by Nuclear Research Council, which is there's a lot of, you know, uh, procedure to go through there, um, which makes it difficult to build new reactors. For fusion, um, they've decided to regulate ish or, or administer that process under the same guidelines used for particle accelerators, which is great, which is really awesome, which is much more, much more uh, uh, enabling uh, than, than having sort of the, the, the bigger sort of NRC fission power plant process in place. Yeah, that would, that would kill it having the NRC fission power plant process, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So fusion like that's like energy a, has a much, oh yeah. So it's just much, much simplified by comparison and, and not administered by the DRC. Sorry, the, the NRC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's like guidance right now, right? That's not like a final decision. This is like a preliminary, this is kind of roughly how we see it, our opinion on it. So this is kind of what you can expect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we're fortunate that there's not a lot of people that are actually like anti-fusion, right? Um, very fortunate. I think I think it's pretty unanimous that this is a great technology. I think the sort of the spread of opinions is more just on how feasible it is. I think so. It's more a question of if we can do it, not if we can. Should we? Right? I think with nuclear, the, the fission nuclear tech, the tragedy. It's we could totally do it. <laughs> we can do it quite well, actually. Um, and it's just this question of should we? So it's kind of like, oh man, like that's a lost technology, right? Um, and current, currently there, there is not, there's a lot of great collaborations between um, both elected representatives, industry associations, uh, like department, departments of research and energy uh, and technology in the United States, also internationally. Um, there's a fusion industry association led by Andrew Holland, which is awesome, doing really good advocacy work and public awareness and sort of advocating on behalf of fusion companies as like a, as like a group of, of shared interests. And so there's a lot of collaboration too in the industry. And I think the impression, again, I don't, I don't run a fusion company and I don't work in policy regulations. I'm an engineer, right? So this is just my perception of, of, of being in the ecosystem a little bit. Um, but it seems like there's a lot of actually like genuinely positive collaborations between like Department of Energy funding milestone grant programs, funding collaborations with research universities, really facilitating this, like they really want to see this happen, right? This is, this is, um, and, and there's, there's growing, I guess what you call sort of like congressional or, or public awareness of it as well, where people are pro this and want to see it being developed. So I think there's a lot of really positive uh, opti optimism and, and, and like positive collaborations on it too. Yeah. That's why I also invested in a nuclear fusion company. And that's kind of my bet is that we, we have another bet, right? Or a chance at a kind of a nuclear revival because it's less mm. encumbered or it has less of, a, you know, fusion just has a bad brand. So they have this uphill battle against existing regulations yeah. and sort of carrying a perception of it as like dirty mm -hmm. or dangerous, which it isn't. Right. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But with fusion, we kind of have a chance to start from scratch, right? And to, um, well, start without all of these, um, with, with this baggage, right? So give it a kind of a it's true cool brand that's appealing right yeah. from the beginning, from the start. T totally agree with that sentiment. I, I personally, I'm still very pro nuclear fission, right? Like I'm still actually, you know, I, I don't know if these things really trade off against each other. That's, that's strongly, um, if you think about, we need to mass produce reactors, right? Of some kind, like thousands per year type thing. Okay. Like to keep up with energy demand in the first place, but also to decarbonize the current electrical grid, because there's currently so many power plants that are running on coal and gas and whatever, uh, that you got to replace, you, you know, you can't just build new power. That's clean. You got to replace the old power too. And, and then also eventually get into the business of replacing power plants and so forth. So it's like, you know. Um, f fusion, so in the industry, most companies have set their targets for getting positive break-even fusion in the mid 2030s, right? And I don't think we can afford to wait that long to start decarbonizing our grid with stable, reliable, cheap, clean energy, right? There's no reason to actually. So, so fission and fusion nuclear technologies are in my mind, you know, um, they're very related. They're very related. Uh, they both offer the same kind of like, you know, stable, reliable, clean grid energy, but let's not wait. 
Like there's no point in waiting, right? We can build nuclear power plants today and we can start building them by the dozens. We can start building them by the hundreds. We know how to, we have proven designs that work that can be mass produced, that can be built in assembly line fashion or whatever, right? Instead of as there are currently, which is like each power plant is like an airport that has like dozens of independent contractors and it's all their first time working on an airport. So they haven't done it before. Like, let's make it like a, a business of building nuclear power plants. Um, and then as fusion comes online, what we do is a few things. First off, we kill the geopolitical fuel constraint issue, right? Um, there's also, see, see, one of the big things limiting the uh, spread and adoption of fission power throughout the planet over the last few decades is concerns of nuclear weapons proliferation, right? Is that you can use fission power plants to enrich uranium to build nuclear bombs. That's a huge threat. That's a huge threat to have, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't really want maybe fission power plants all over the place where they could be, you know, subject to malicious actors and, and captured and so forth. And so that's always been a concern. Um, the fusion doesn't have that, right? Cause, cause it, you can't really use it to breed fissile materials. Um, and, and the fuel is, can be got from anywhere. Uranium only comes from like Kazakhstan and I think Canada and Australia. Um, so, so there's long-term merits why fusion is like, for sure, like the kind of golden, a triple a solution to energy. Right. But in terms of like what we're facing right now, which is like pretty big problems um, in terms of our ability to get cheap, reliable energy, uh, we need to use solutions that are available now, right? And, and I think it's actually kind of like embarrassing that energy is getting more expensive in time, right? Like how, how the hell does anyone think that's okay, right? Like, because <laughs> energy is so foundational to the cost of almost every good and service you can imagine existing in the economy right? The price of energy is like the ultimate bottom line inflation on the price of something else, you know? So we, I, I think we actually have like a moral responsibility to produce as much energy as cheaply and as cleanly as possible, because that production of energy is just bottom line foundational to human prosperity and growth of our society. And if you look at like, when did the quality of life really start improving for people on the planet? And when did population take off? It's when we started burning hydrocarbons. Like it sucks to say that because we recognize that that is a climate threat on such a scale as industrial society can do. But that's when things got better, okay? And our lives are nice today because we had the industrial revolution and because we had available cheap energy, right? And our lives are gonna be, continue to be nice and get better the more we can make energy cheap and abundant and, and clean. We recognize now we can't actually just burn whatever you want, right? There's actually big issues with that when you have billions of people living on a planet. Um, yeah, so I'm actually just sort of very bullish on nuclear in general. And, and I think there's a public sentiment shift as well it, 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 in a lot of places, which is really interesting. I think it's actually accelerated a lot in the last even just year, really, with people becoming pro-nuclear, new projects being proposed. You know, some countries are like, they don't have the same kind of pol politics, political system, right? So they're just like, yeah, we, we are building plants. Like we are just all in on building nuclear power plants because we recognize like the technical merits of that. We want to get good at doing it. And, and one of the things I'm so frustrated with today is that over decades, we've regulated into the ground a domestic nuclear industry by, by burdening it with regulatory overhead and liability and considerations and so forth, which I, I get the justifications for from, from a safety perspective. But that has driven up the cost of nuclear power, right? It's not the materials and the labor. Okay, to, to get nuclear energy on the grid. That's not what's expensive. It's our decision making about the policy frameworks we've put into place, which is a reflection of our biases and beliefs about how the world should work, and also a reflection of our own ignorances about physical and engineering realities. So um, we've chosen to make nuclear fission expensive. It is, it is by far, in its own sense, if you look at terms of energy material costs, probably one of the cheapest energy sources you could think of, right? Like, you know, I think solar is amazing and the breakthroughs in solar panel efficiency have been incredible, but it takes a huge amount of land. And maybe I don't want my countryside to look like black armored carapace, okay? Which is what it would look like if you had to have all your energy supplied by solar. Um, so a nuclear power plant, you know, it's so dense, it's so small, it's so reliable. It's like that's, you know, sort of one, one like fuel shipment can last like 10 years, replaces like tens of thousands of coal carts on a train that would be burning otherwise. So it's like the, the from an engineer kind of physics perspective, and I used to be very anti-nuclear when I was, before I really started to look at the facts. My uh, 
uncle was one of the founders of Greenpeace, oddly enough. And so they've been super anti-nuclear for a long time. But now recently, one of the founders of Greenpeace has come out for nuclear power saying, actually, no, I think this is good. Like that started, that organization started against nuclear testing, right? So the generation of people that lived under the Cold War threat of a mutually assured nuclear exchange between two global superpowers, the nuclear specter was always there. It was a sort of Damocles hanging over their head. And rightfully so, because that's like the most terrifying scenario in the possible, right? Um, but that, that, that has now become associated with nuclear power on its own as well. So I think that's, I think I'm hopeful that people can help re-educate. And there's now like uh, Mark Nelson and Isodope or Isabella, these guys are, I met them in New York recently. They're awesome. And uh, yeah, they're actually like doing a lot to help people understand the benefits of this. Yeah, I agree. I'm seeing more and more the sentiment shifting also from like environmentalists that are now endorsing nuclear Greta, for example, as well. Right. So there's a really big Greta chance. Greta endorsed nuclear power? What? Yeah. Yeah. Like no a year way. ago or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I don't really follow her at all, but uh, cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, sh it shows, it speaks to something real and very important that there is a sentiment shift. We have a chance to get this right, especially with fusion being less encumbered by how we've done things in the past. And also I think nuclear fission is promising, right? So we have Brad Kubelas in the podcast to really think deeply about changing the business model in very important and meaningful ways. Mm. So we have a really great chance there. And it's just so important for the reasons mentioned for civilizational progress, right? So again, Jay Strauss Hall, you have that Henry Adams curve that directly correlates with um, productive economic growth, right? And, you know, the, what WTF happened in 1971, right? So that's about when energy yeah. usage started kind of stagnating, yeah. right? So, yes. um, so we have a chance to, to get this nuclear revival. Now, um, what else do you think needs to happen? Or what are the most important things for any sort of aspiring entrepreneurs who listen to this? Or, you know, ones who might be working on the policy side of things, what, what should they focus on to get this right? That's an interesting question. Um, hmm. So, so startups always face this difficult problem. That thing you work on has to be the intersection of both something worth doing and a viable business model. Right. And those are not always uh, coincident sort of Venn diagram graphs. Right. So there's a lot of really ambitious, worthwhile things that should be pursued, but might not be packaged into like some competitive sort of corporate vehicle. Right. So that's, that's, that's a difficult thing to struggle with. Um, I think for me, I've always thought about working on problems that I think are, are just worthwhile. Right. Like really fundamentally. Um, whether that was infectious diseases in the past or energy today. Um, I think that's super important. I think there's this, uh, you know, hmm, yeah. It's, you know, be, uh, yeah, like, like, like pick a challenge that's even worth failing at. I don't know. It's a weird way to phrase it, but like try something ambitious, you know, like really fucking shoot for the moon. Sorry, I swore. Um, but, uh, yeah, cause that's like, I, I think for me, I've found you have to work on something where um, you see the importance of the mission. It's so, it's so fundamental. And so you can really like commit to it and marry it, right? Because I think working on these problems, they, they are decade problems at the, at the least, right? Um, I know nuclear fission startups in the United States have had a tough, tough, tough time because of regulatory issues. And so I think a lot of them are actually approaching customers external to the country to, to sell to. And, and to get energy on the grid. Um, on the nuclear issues scene, really, it's a matter of public sentiment and, and convincing elected representatives, right? It's an issue of nimbyism to some extent. And, and I think starting to debunk the uh, uh, established anti-nuclear energy sort of landscape of lobbyists and interest groups and so forth, and really understand, hey, wait a minute, in whose interest is it? to prevent stable, relief, reliable, cheap nuclear power from coming on the grid, right? Do you think that's in anyone's like economic self-interest, right? So yeah, it is like any current sort of oil and gas producing company, they don't want that. Hell no, they hate that. That would be terrible for them, right? Um, 
So understanding the kind of set of incentives that have led to our current collective mindset. And I think there's always this issue with, with sort of starting companies in ambitious spaces where there's this challenge of communicating that vision and the importance of the problem you're trying to solve, right? Communicating that vision and convincing people that it is the right problem to work on um, is how you get trust to both carry an investment and invest it. So use it judiciously to build a team, to build a company, to build technology, convince the best people to work for you, all that kind of stuff. So I think it's like understanding that, you know, you have to sell a vision and you have to sell yourself as a person to execute on that in, in undertaking something that you have personal conviction on that you feel willing to commit to and dedicate yourself to completely is super important. I think energy is probably one of the number one issues in the planet for that purpose. Um, so the, the narrative is very compelling, you know? Um, yeah, I think also to understand that there is now a emerging nascent kind of nuclear technology landscape, right? Or nuclear technology ecosystem, right? So, so problems common to many companies building the space that every company has to solve, right? Like I could just name a couple in fusion, right? Neutronic simulations is difficult and super niche and bespoke, right? And not many industries use that. So there's not like a lot of established, that's like the open source community, which is doing a lot of amazing work. Um, but, but it's not like there's an ANSYS or COMSOL for Neutronics, right? So that kind of stuff, like also like Marathon Fusion building, like, uh, tritium extraction technology, right? Every fusion company pretty much says they're going to breed tritium fuel. No one knows how to get that out of the stuff they breed it in, right? So finding, you know, understanding the industry landscape and saying, look, all these companies are going to have this issue and problem, right? Uh, sorry, this, this problem in common, um, is one way to kind of find, I think, fruitful, high leverage things where you can see okay, look, this is an important problem to solve. And there's going to be a compelling business model built around that because, because the, the, the front end of the story is the narrative on how this helps the planet and why it's worth role fighting to, to fight, right? The back end of the story is the financial model that says this is going to be an actual returns producing venture. So having those two things connected is, is super important and understanding how they relate to each other. I think having an understanding of how physics and engineering considerations actually produce features of the competitive landscape and will affect the performance of your financial model under different assumptions, right? That's a huge one. You can also even think further ahead, right? Which is like, okay, assume now there's operators in this industry and they're all producing things. What are second and third order effects as a result, right? So one thing is like um, the production of nuclear waste by fission power plant, right? And, and so what kinds of things does that enable? And I was, re I was learning yesterday this cool technology called like nuclear diamond batteries, which is this very esoteric and, and interesting um, and probably niche in applications. But basically the gist is you can take the graphite that's used as a moderator in nuclear fission plants, scrape off a layer of carbon-14, which has been irradiated by neutrons, package that with normal carbon-12 in a diamond and compress it. And the high energy electrons given off by that carbon as it decays into nitrogen will actually excite um, uh, charge hole pairs in the diamond lattice that like produces some kind of voltage and you can like collect a bit of energy with that. And you can produce this kind of like nuclear battery that lasts for like thousands of years or hundreds of years, depending on the isotope you choose, depending on how you configure it, um, that doesn't have to ever get recharged, which is like crazy, right? So kind of thinking like, if we get there, this is the trend of where things are going. You can think, do I want to solve foundational problems, right? One of the like start a fusion company, start a nuclear company that builds a reactor right? That's like very difficult, but maybe one of the most important fights to fight. Then there's also like the ancillary, like what are picks and shovels to that goal? What are things that would enable and accelerate other people where I know I actually have, it's kind of, it's, you know, actually have customers because they have uh, funding and they need to buy stuff so I can sell to them, right? Um, and then also thinking like, given those things become established, what are now second, third order effects where I can capitalize on this new landscape of technology and materials? Um, to enable a business venture that wouldn't have otherwise made sense. And then now I just build for it, right? So Casey Hanmar, this guy is super smart, uh, CEO of, I think, Terra Power, it's called. He has this amazing blog post, which I just, I just love, where he's just breaking down, like, look what happens if the kind of the energy cost of direct air capture gets to a certain point and the price of sort of hydrogen. And he just lays out this like physics first economic argument saying, look, if we get to this intersection of conditions, this becomes the most competitive, most viable uh, market approach to solving this problem, 
right? So I think that's really compelling as well. When you can say like, things are converging to this point, here's the progress to get there. When we get there, you have what you call in physics, like a, a regime change or like a, a new regime, like a phase change. You know, you go from solid to liquid, okay? You've been in solid phase for so long, slowly heating up, suddenly everything becomes a liquid. And now it's like a new business venture makes sense, whereas it didn't make sense before. Fantastic. Yeah, and the um, front at which uh, I think uh, I want to help accelerate that trend is of new governance models, right? Because there's a lot of interesting lessons that I cover a lot in my podcast on why we messed up when it comes to regulatory side, right? So. Yeah. Um, for listeners, or you want to check like episode 67 with Sam Peltzman, thought about that question for like 60 years of like the public choice incentives that public officials and regulators have. And it's a problem, right? So, and that's a risk mm -hmm. for the adoption of any future new technology for, you know, a lot of totally. complex and detailed reasons. Totally. Um, but what if we have a different or try different governance models, right? So. The idea that yeah. we're pursuing here in this special economic zone um, in Prospera is what if, you know, regulators are not the government, right? The regulations are not produced by government, but like by insurance companies, right? So hmm. they don't want you know, to, they don't want to give you like something that's like reckless because then they have to pay right. large sums, but they also don't want you to, you know, hold you back from doing business, right? So they have kind of the best mm -hmm. incentive to, to set the right kind of rates or to select, have the right regulations selected yeah. because they're going to make it prohibitively expensive to you if you like don't mm. select a good regulation, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's really awesome. I, I have always believed, well, for a long time, I mean, not always as a kid, I obviously didn't understand this stuff, but I first studied sociology, economics in university, then later went back to physics and engineering after having done some other random stuff in sales and, and so forth. Um, I developed this uh, really conviction that Incentive structures are the soil from which any new institution or venture or organization grows, right? And I think the miracle of the experiment of America and just in general, sort of liberal democratic republics, right, as a form of organization, is that they set up incentive structures that allowed for this, you know, and there's contention on to what extent this exists today, but this meritocratic achievement, this meritocracy of ideas, this, this competition and formation of new social institutions and so forth. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of cool. Like our, our norms of dealing with each other really are the protocol of society, right? And, and choosing the right protocol really determines what kind of platform you can build, you know? Um, so I think there's, yeah, I think it's really interesting to rethink this. Protocol you know, democracy exactly. as it exists today, it is a technology to solve a social coordination problem. Right. And it was formulated in a time when we had written, we were writing things with quills, right? Quills and ink pots. Okay. So this is, this is the tech stack at the birth of representative democracy as we practice today, not like the Greek form way back, but considering what we have now, our ability to synthesize and distill public sentiment and popular opinion and formulate policy that addresses that. And, and one thing you see too, is that in any ecosystem, as it's been established over time, you can start to develop parasitic behaviors or basically rent-seeking behaviors, which we also know as regulatory capture, right? Which are people that aren't actually provide, like, like contributing to the bottom line in some way. Really what they've done is they've staked out for themselves some niche where they just extract rents from other people's and their business, you know? And this, this, this net net over time is you just add to the friction cost of doing anything, right? And you just burn more and more energy as just waste heat in the engine of the economy, right? And, and you can see it. I mean, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to know this because if you look at public works projects, like the Golden Gate Bridge, I live in San Francisco. I looked this up. When that was built, it cost in today's inflation adjusted dollars, $760 million, which is a lot of money. But that's the Golden Gate Bridge. That's a, a world icon. You know, this is a massive piece of infrastructure. Now it's like the suicide nets they built, like whatever, some number of years ago, were like 400. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and to extend the, yeah, and to extend the Caltrain, like they're, you know, debating like, oh, we want to put like another mile and a half into town or whatever. It's going to cost like billions of dollars and insane. And it's like, how do we get to the point where we have seized ourselves up with like our ability to act on stuff effectively with endless committees and reviews? And, and, and I think often there's, compelling narratives 
for considerations of safety and, and community engagement and so forth that, that justify having additional layers of review to avoid acts and stuff like that. You have to acknowledge that there's a, there's a cost to that, whereas the ability to get stuff done, right? And so, you know, I'm actually, yeah, I think it's, I'm optimistic that we can sort of take what's worth the best from our, from our 250, 300 years of running these kinds of social institutions as well as recognize what hasn't worked. And, and, you know, even in the United States, right, the constitution, Thomas Jefferson thought it would be like rewritten every generation and so forth. So, you know, being willing to update the, uh, the, the protocol that we all operate by, except that that will ultimately enable the sort of, you know, floating diamond cities and orbital rings and space elevators and so forth. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah, exactly. there's this great, that's great what, uh, my work, it, but yeah. Go ahead. Oh, just, um, yeah, few worthwhile endeavors have been undertaken in consideration of short-term profitability, right? Short-term profitability is fully just aware of the current local incentive structure and, and what's the fertile soil here, right? And you can build lots of cool stuff in that sense, but not, not every worthwhile problem is going to be you, you can bootstrap or cash trap or, you know, I don't know, a willingness to change the rules, belief that we can change the rules and understanding what things are viable today as ventures, as businesses, as collaborative organizations, what parts of those are contingent on the rules we've chosen versus what parts of those are contingent on the laws of physics. Because we can't change physics, right? You can't cheat nature, as Simon said, but you can convince people of something that isn't true. And you can convince them to vote for things against their interest, right? So debunking what, what, what's expensive and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense in terms of, you know, what's true physically and then just what's a social sort of contingent truth, what's a historical accident. I think that's another important kind of part of the mindset to have. Yeah, exactly. Like the protocol level of society, which is exactly my work and large part of this podcast are about. So really grateful that you gave us a really rich insight into nuclear fusion and this emerging technology and kind of the opportunity it provides to arrive at super abundant energy and material super abundance that comes with it. And also we learned that there's very good reasons to be optimistic that we see a nuclear revival and that fusion could be at the forefront of that, right? So it has engineering challenges to be solved, but it has a very good chance to start with the less encumbered Sort of regulatory design, right? So that is, I think, where right, there's a fundamental and deep and big opportunity and is also generally perceived mm -hmm. as a good thing, right? It doesn't have the same mm -hmm. sentiment and baggage that Fission has. Yeah. So, um, Andrew, um, what else would you point listeners towards where they can learn more about your work or is there anything you're looking for right now with, uh, with the company that you're working for and where can people find you to reach out to you? Totally. Well, so I'm most active on Twitter, so it's probably best way to find me. Um, I, I, I'm new to making stuff online and it's been a lot of fun and I love it as an excuse to learn things about new topics. So if, uh, yeah, reach out if you're interested in working any of the areas I talk about, if you're a founder in that space, developing a new company, uh, looking to connect with investors or new talents or even just brainstorm. Um, also if you're an investor, so if I can help in any way, connect people together that are working on cool stuff, I'd be honored to do that. Um, if you want to work in nuclear fusion specifically, if you're an engineer, engineering background of some kind, or really technical skill, or even from other backgrounds, right? And you're interested in the fusion industry, uh, reach out to, I'm also on LinkedIn, just Andrew Cote. It's hopefully I'm searchable. Maybe you can link my Twitter handle and people can find me that way. Um, I found you. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Fantastic. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on the show. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Talk again soon.